here. Welcome class to Sunday school. That's what it is. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You want to open us up? Simple prayer? No, no. Oh, okay. For me? My, Larry, my friend Mary over here. Okay. I don't know how to do that. I know how to do okay. that. Okay. All right. Today, the triumph of God's kingdom, our central truth is this. Jesus Christ will return in glory and power to establish his kingdom. Our key verse from Revelation 11:15: the kingdoms of this world are, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And from our learning objectives, we have Examine, we need to examine the message of the revelation, especially as it relates to the defeat of evil and the eternal kingdom of God. We need to find and value joy in the face of present circumstances uh, through the assurance that our God-given future. Uh, and we need to worship Christ and live in hope, anticipating his ultimate victory. Those are great messages, especially today when we have so much going on and people are being so depressed and so down about the things that are going on in the world and so much fear. But we have a hope in the future. We have more than we could ever ask for. Even if I have a little, I'm probably more, far richer than most people in this world. And yet, people are unhappy, ungrateful. I found out, <laughs> I didn't know this, but actually Thursday, for some, was on Thanksgiving Day, okay? And I won't go into what that means, but it's basically, there are a lot of people who are unthankful. And when people are not grateful for things, they're not happy. You wanna be happy? Be grateful for what you have. Count your blessings. You so, say, well, I don't have the blessings that my sister over there has. I'm not talking about your sister. What has God given you? You know, even the simple blessings. I got a tap water that I can go pick up water anytime I want. There are people that go five miles to pick up water that's not even fit to drink, let alone go pick it up. There are people that are rummaging, there are kids in places that are rummaging in, gar in garbage to find out things that sell, that they can sell something so they can get something to eat for find something to eat. And we have so much blessings that God has given us, but we don't see the obvious because we're looking to say what I don't have. So, in Revelation 5, 16, 6 through 14, and I saw the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the hand of him who sat upon the throne. <clears throat> when he took, he had taken the, the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and break its seals. For you were slaughtered, and you were purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom of priests for our God, and they, are, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne living, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, of thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under earth and on the sea and all things in them saying, To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, the blessing, the honor, the glory, and the dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. So what does Revelation teach us about why we should 
worship Jesus today? I mean, just listen to the words. Well, like we're supposed to be praising God all the time. Why? Why should because I praise he's him? He's the only one that's worthy. Jesus is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he was the lamb that was slain. Ah, the lamb who was slain. But for a particular reason. Anybody else? We have three groups here in our shouting praise. We have four living creatures and 24 elders. Now, these are lessons in themselves. <laughs> okay? So I won't go fully into those lessons because I don't have a lot of time with that. Those are lessons in themselves about who these creatures might be. And there's a lot of speculation about who they might be. And the 24 elders, even, there's some speculation about who they are. But these are before the throne of God constantly. Myriads of angels, of thousands of thousands, every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the sea and on the sea. All creation is saying it's, it's been upset. That's why we should worship. All creation is worshiping God. They're worshiping, worshiping Jesus Christ. We should be worshiping. Man has a tendency to think that he is the higher form of life in his universe. And the truth of it is, is that Jesus Christ, what he did for us, allows us to be before God. Amen. And without him, we are sunk. And these creatures are telling us the importance of this. And here, you know, it's interesting that they also have, these elders also have the golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You'll find out later if you read Revelation that uh, the prayers of the saints, before the bowl judgments come down, the prayers of the saints are added to the incense before they, the judgments come down upon the earth. For the world has, has constantly persecuted the saints. And God's judgment, he uses even the prayers of the saints. These people... These people that persecute the church, they are going to get the lesson of judgment that God has promised them. If they have rejected his goal, have rejected his Christ. And the prayers of the saints are part of that. The Lamb of God, as if slain, only one is found worthy to open the scroll. Only one. And John even started to weep because nobody was found worthy until Jesus Christ, the slain Lamb, stood up. Now we see the Lamb of God now as if slain, but later we see the Lion of Judah. All right, whole different picture. All right, he was found. Op he opened to open the, the seal to begin the tribulation. I struck that out because the tribulation, technically, it begins the tribulation because he opens the first seal, but it's actually to the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation comes from a word apocalypso, which means the revealing. In this case, it's also the word used for apocalypse, is where we get our English word apocalypse, which we've always said was the end of the world. Well, the truth of it is, the world doesn't end, okay? There's not gonna be any zombie apocalypse. There's not gonna be aliens taking over the world. There's not going to be climate change that's going to destroy our planet. So we, for, so for 11 years, we're hearing, you know, we got another 11 years before it's all over. Well, it's not what the Bible says. And somebody would say, well, you're a science denier. No, I'm a science verifier. I know something about the science, and I know something because I read, and I understand better, and I know what politics is. But getting the other side, the point of it is, is that God has more. Because in the end, there will be a new heaven and the earth, and then the world will be destroyed. But not in the way that people think it will. Now, during the tribulation, it will look like the world was going to end. But the truth of it is, if you read your Bible, that's not the case. Because we are talking about the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand years of peace, Jesus Christ of the land. And then you got to read the book. Now, Jesus, there are seven. Uh, seven is the biblical number for completion or complete, completeness. All right? There are 
seven horns. Horns were uh, a picture of power in, the, in the, the Bible. So he had all power. He's omnipotent. He had seven eyes. He was all seeing, all knowing, omniscient. Seven spirits. We talked about God's presence in the Holy Spirit, omnipresent. These are descriptions of God himself. This is the same description of Jesus Christ. So we have this lamb. That, and you know that this, this is where the symbols get a hold of you because you, you, you look at these symbols and say, what do these things mean? And then you learn through time different things about how they mean things in different places. The horn, for example, has always been a picture of the use other places, like in Daniel, about power. Um, the God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all the tribe, peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing before the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God, God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, uh, honor, power, and might belong to, the, our, to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders responded, saying to me, those who are clothed in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? And I said to him, Lord, my Lord, you know. And he said, to, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, <coughs> they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will no longer hunger or thirst, <clears throat> nor will the sun beat down on them, nor scorching heat. For the Lamb is the center of the throne, will be their shepherd, and will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So, in eternity, the redeemed will include every tribe, nation, people, and language. How should that impact their involvement in missions and evangelism? It's greatly impacted, shouldn't it? Because it tells us that God wants everyone to know him. All throughout the whole earth. And of course we get a lot of pushback by about the validity of other religions. We are to offer them the peace of Jesus Christ. The gospel, when you understand there are many people in this world looking for peace. And a lot of times religion is about doing things to make yourself right for God. The problem is how do you know when you're done? How do you know if God has accepted you? You don't get an email. You don't get a text. Okay? You don't get... Uh, telegram or anything saying good job you keep it up you're doing great you don't know how do you know so they constantly live their life in fear of not being having enough to be ready for God and yet Jesus Christ has said none of that matters believe on me but when you do believe on him and you start to do the works that he has given you to do you do it out of gratitude, your faith gets stronger, and you will have the peace that you've always wanted. Because you will feel that peace in your heart. But Jesus Christ is leading you in your heart. So missions is important. Whether that mission be down the street, next door, at your workplace, or across the world. Missions are always available. The problem is sometimes it's opportunity. Because often people don't want to hear it. But there's always opportunities that come up. 
You know, I found that pain is a great motivator. Pain is a great reach out, or reaching out to people. When people are in pain, when people are suffering, they're looking for answers. You know, I, I used to suffer a lot from depression. I got into a lot of alcohol. I had a lot of drinking, alcoholism. I, I, I won't go into the whole picture, but the point of it is, a couple of times trying to kill myself in my life besides the drinking. What I know to be true is today, I can't remember the last time I had a day I was depressed. I can remember having days when I don't feel all that great, but never to the point of, of suicide, never to the point of taking a drink, never to feeling like the world is crashing down upon me. Because I can have peace. I have it in Jesus Christ. I read my Bible and it keeps reminding me of that, bringing me back to that. So when the world wants to crowd in and take over, I keep pushing it out because I put my Bible in front of me. Okay? They can't get past the Bible. How should our attitudes toward people around us and around the world be shaped by the fact that in eternity that the redeemed will include every tribe, nation, people, and language? You know, when the, the great missionaries started going out into the world, they made one mistake. The biggest mistake they made was trying to get people to conform to European ways of doing things. And that means that they were the pastors, you listen to me, you have to do it in this way. Today, the missions that are successful, what represented the new, the, the, the new church, the beginnings of our uh, the, the New Testament church, the model was you go and teach, grow up pastors and leaders there, let them go and teach. That's the model that Jesus wanted for us. That's the model that is successful in the church. The idea that we have to say, well, you have to be like me, is ridiculous. In the end, we're all different. We are, dif we are men and women, we are old and young, we are different, we have different, we have different colored skin, well, maybe not in this room as much, but in the end, there are people that are different. So what? We're all different. We've never been the same. So why is it that people are trying to help us conform to certain ways? Okay? Yeah, in the 1700s, I think, um, some of the English were sending some of the early missionaries to China, to the outskirts of China, and they were dressed in their English garb, and they remarked how um, happy the Chinese were. They, were. they were always laughing and smiling, whenever they came to preach, and they, they didn't realize that they were laughing at the way they looked. And uh, that's when the, they literally went and they cut their hair and put a little ponytail and dressed like the natives, and instantly there was a revolution of people listening to the gospel. So, so um, we, are not, we are not sending missionaries to impose American culture like it's an American missionary. I think that's part of the problem. The Assemblies of God has been very wise because they've always recognized this, and that's why Assembly of God Mission, there's over 70 million people work globally in churches, only 3.5 million in the U.S. Um, so our movement outside of the continental U.S. Is, is unprecedented. We have hundreds of thousands of churches outside of the continental U.S., but they do the same thing. They establish a, a, a framework of, of, of getting people saved and those that are called and equipping those as quickly as possible then to reach their own people. Paul, Paul taught that. He basically trained up people in those areas. He would go there to support them, but he was never there to constantly lead them and tell them what to do. He helped them by giving them advice. The letters were about giving an advice to people, but it was about training up other leaders so that they can lead where they were. They understood the people in the area better, and they knew the people better in the area. Paul was highly intelligent, and he understood that they needed to understand, but the people that were already there were the best people to teach to them. So he taught them. So we need to understand the same thing, that people are going to be different. 
You know, I, I heard a story about, you know, the Catholic Church took a lot of people and brought them in, pagans, and changed a lot of their holidays into Christianized holidays. And, and of course, they, you know, that's where we get our Christmas in December, for example. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> but in the end, there was a lot of Christianization of pagan statues and different things. So it, it would be palatable for, non for these people who are pagans. But the problem is, is that it didn't, it didn't, they tried to get them to conform to their ways by making things easier for them to adopt to. So we adopted a lot of things that aren't necessarily the best things. But there was a, a monk, I think it was, a monk or it was a Catholic priest or something that was in uh, Hawaii. This was, I don't know, the 1800s or something, many, many years ago. And he was at, he was trying to preach to the leper colony, but nobody was coming. So he spent a number of years there. Nothing happened. Nobody was coming. So he decided he would get ready to leave because it just wasn't, there wasn't anything happening there. Uh, and of course, he brought his European ideas of doing things, but nobody was coming. And I mean, he cared about the people. Then the, when he went to leave, he found out that he saw that he had white spots on his hands. He had the beginnings of leprosy. He became a leper. That night when he opened the church, because he couldn't leave now, that night when he opened the church, it was packed. People came to him because they said they, he was just like them. See, he was able to reach them because instead of trying to get them to come up to his level, he became at their level and he was able to reach them. Now, we don't have to become lepers to preach the leper colony, but the point of it is, is that we have to got to accept other people for their differences. So what they're different? Of course we're different. No identity politics prohibited, okay? They're prohibited. Now this idea that people are separate, and we gotta be different, and some people are better than other people, that is utterly ridiculous and it is anti-biblical. In Revelation 11, 15 through 19. And you hear about this all the time in politics these days. You know, I'm sick and tired of the whole thing. Um, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones before God fell on their face and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, the, the one who is and who was and who has taken your great power and has become to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, and the prophets, and the saints of those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And this temple of God which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder in an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So how should we respond to God's ultimate judgment of sin? Well, given the time. Well, humility. First thing, we have to realize that we are sinners. Now, that's not the message that people want to preach today, because we want to preach nicer things so people are more comfortable. We don't want to preach about people's sin. And it's like none of us would ever make the grade if we were judged purely on our actions. But be patient with me because God's not through with me yet. <laughs> Construction going on here. Okay? God has better things for us. And, and, you know, so there are days when I'm just totally off. I don't make the right decisions. I don't say the right things. So I try to, but the Bible keeps bringing me back to where, to where I should be. So God's reminding me constantly about how little I know about the truth because I constantly keep drawing away to other things. We need repentance. Now, humility leads to repentance. You can't have repentance without humility. You can't just say, well, I, said, I, I made a decision for Jesus Christ. When do you need your decision for Jesus Christ? 
Really, I, that's a term that really it doesn't make any sense because Jesus Christ made a decision for you. Okay? He decided to obey his Father. And he went to the cross. Okay? I don't need to make a decision. My decision should be that I should... Well, there is one decision I should make, and that is to give my will to him and believe him. And we need to change our lives. Sometimes fast, sometimes slow, sometimes a little forward, sometimes a little backwards. But as long as we're always moving forwards rather than totally backwards. The message from the very beginning at the fall of mankind. If we look right back in the book of Genesis, right in the third chapter, you know, I've heard it often said, by, I will never mention his name, but he's often said in the back of the book, we win. You know, he's read the back of the book, we win. <laughs> but the truth of it is, is that if you read more in different parts of the Bible, even at the very third chapter of Genesis, we know then that we're going to win. From beginning from Genesis through Revelation, there are different points where God shows us that we win, that Jesus Christ is going to reign. In the third chapter, after Adam and Eve sinned, and God cursed the, the serpent, and he says that you will bruise his heel, but he will stomp on your head. I was paraphrasing it, but in the end, you will injure him. That was the cross. But he will destroy you because the head was considered the power, the play, place of power. So he will destroy your power. And that's what he did. So what looked like a failure at the cross turned out to be success on Resurrection Day. Because he couldn't, as the pastor said, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> but in the end, Jesus Christ rose from the grave as he promised because he had the ability to raise himself. There was no sin in him. And what allow, now it allows God to judge our sins for what he did. It means that it frees us up. Because here's the thing. Now, there are a lot of things been going around these days about God is love, so how can a God of love send people to hell? Now, we send ourselves to hell. Because God is gracious and kind and loving he has given us the ability to be forgiven through Jesus Christ. We are obstinate and we won't accept that. We think that there's things we have to do. This is what the essence of religion is, is that we have to do something to be better so that God will accept us. How do you know when you've done it, as I said? So in the beginning, we, we needed a substitute sacrifice. Shedding, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's not being taught in a lot of places these days. The idea of the shedding of blood, the idea of sin, those are not technically wanting to, people want to hear those things. They don't want to hear about revelation because people are fearful or they don't, they don't understand it, so they, they stay away from it. The sad thing is, is, I've read polls recently, I don't go by totally by polls, but the truth of it is, is that there are a few people that ever read their Bible from beginning to end. And there are a lot of people that don't read it at all. And they go to church all the time, or once in a while. But there are many, there's a good percentage of people that don't even believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Christ. And these, are, these people are calling themselves Christians. The cross... Not because Jesus sympathized with us. It wasn't for the fact that he sympathized, but because he represented us. He took the sin of the world upon himself. It was his reason to be born into this world. Not to be a good teacher, not to give us things like the Beatitudes and the, uh, the, you know, the, the different things that he gave us, the teaching. But was born into this world to go to the cross. His blood was shed for us for the remission of sins for all time, past, present, and future, and only once. Now, a priest, there, during the time of the year, he would go in and constantly, every Sabbath, they would have a sacrifice. 
In special times of the year, there were certain sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, the, the uh, Passover, uh, the pa Pentecost, the different places where they had pe different kinds of uh, sacrifices that they would offer. But this was one sacrifice. Before he would have offer sacrifice, especially on the Day of Atonement, he would offer a sacrifice for himself to cleanse himself. <coughs> And then he would offer sacrifice for the nation. The problem was that he was always having to offer sacrifice for himself. Jesus did that once, never has to do it again. And that sacrifice covers the nation, that is, his, the believers who believe upon him. In Revelation 12, 7 through 11. And there was war in the heaven. Michael and his angels were waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down. And the one who accuses them before God day and night. And they overcome him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Now in this case, anybody who knows Michael was the archangel who watched over Israel. That was his job, and it is his job today, watching over Israel. And he fought against Satan. Satan's not the most powerful angel, okay? In fact, we read later that Satan is chained up for a thousand years. And the, devil, the angels that go to, to grab a hold of him is stronger than him. So what we have to understand is that Satan doesn't have the power unless God allows him to have the power. That his demons don't have the power unless God allows it. We saw this when Jesus would come up, let's say, the, uh, to the demoniac. What they, call, what they called him the demoniac. I mean, you know, the guy was cured after uh, Jesus drove the, the, all these uh, demons out. But in the end, these, whenever, they came to, whenever Jesus came to them, they would fall down on their knees. And they had understood who he was because they knew the power that was in him. They knew that he was the son of God. And they were afraid because he could send them into the abyss. So, what are some common spiritual battles Christians face? Well, I would say, m most would say, well, pick your sin. Name your poison. <laughs> okay? There's any number of different battles that we go through. I think the biggest battle I probably face, that is the hardest sometimes, is maintaining my faith through everyday trials we face. I'm not talking about big things. Oftentimes when big things happen, you are at your strongest. I'm talking about the grind and grit that you gotta go through some days. Yeah. You know, the, the boring and the, and, and the, the, you know, the tramping and the, everything's falling apart, you know. <laughs> the little things. You add them up and eventually, you know, some days you just feel like screaming. <laughs> Especially when you face the physical, tangible evidence contradict what you believe as a Christian. Okay? Jesus said they have peace. Why don't I feel that peace today? <laughs> well, the truth of it is, is the world is constantly changing. I, and if you, I, I read the news because I don't watch the news anymore. I don't watch the fake news. <laughs> I actually go to different places to get my news to hear some truth. I'm tired of hearing the nonsense. I, you know, I never liked to be a, a, I never really was a conformist. I never liked being part of the crowd. If, I, if you didn't accept me for who I am, as I am, who are my friends? And if somebody, believe, if somebody would treat me like that, 
I would like a pair of scissors that I could cut them right off because I don't need friends like that. We got to have a, a Christian perspective. So what do I say? Read your Bible. What does God have to say about it? Forget what the world has to say. But you know, fools say a lot of things, but they say nothing of value because it's all foolish, right? Would you, would you listen to advice from a fool? And I'm not saying people who talk are fools. What I'm saying is that I hear a lot of foolish talk. And then people will say, well, listen to the science, okay? Or listen to the experts. You know what I found out about experts? Often they're wrong. Very often they're wrong. The point of it is, is that we, we need like in baseball, we need a batting average. What's their batting average? How have you done so far? When you find out what their batting average is, they wouldn't even make the farm team, let alone the major leagues. So we need to remind ourselves of God's character. What did God say? He, you know, he is the same in the beginning, from the very beginning to the end. He does not change. What is his character? If his character doesn't change, why do we think sometimes that the world, that God's not listening? We need to look at history, past and present. I'm not talking just biblical history. Look at how the things have, have, have come up in this time. Okay? Up to this time, we can look through history and see God's hand. We need to look at God's promises. What did God say? The promises that were already fulfilled. Not, the one, not only the ones that aren't fulfilled yet, but what did God already do? You'd be amazed how much he thinks he's already done. Of course, if you read your Bible, you might find those things out. Don't water down the message. In other words, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save. Not me, not the pastor, not anybody in this church has that power. It's Jesus Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save. Okay? It is the gospel message is the message that we are supposed to go and give. That's what he told us at the end of Matthew. Go into all the world. And then God's love shines from Genesis to Revelation. Even in Revelation, you know, it was something that I was afraid of because it, it, it's what drew me to God because of fear. But in the end, what I found out was, even in Revelation, God, there is grace and mercy. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll have to run through these real quick here. So Revelation 19, I'll have to, I'm not going to be able to read everything. But in the end, maybe I'll read this part. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And righteousness he judge and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword, so with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God. And on his robe, on his thigh, is the name of King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come and assemble for the great feast of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, in the flesh of all people, both free and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the throne and against his army. You know, I'll leave it at that. The point is, this is the lamb who was slain. This is the picture of the lion of Judah. He is a conqueror, and now he comes to judge. Okay? Again, there are many lessons just in these paragraphs. I can't teach them all because I don't have the time. So why is it significant that the sword is coming from the mouth is the Lord of the Lord in Revelation 19.15? The word of God, power. 
from Zechariah 4, 6b. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and is piercing and far from division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, from Hebrews 4.12. Jesus was call, is called the word of God. He was made, he, now he is made manifest. He has come as a conqueror. He has come as a judge. Now at one point, there will be drawn into the Armageddon, or Armageddon, is about the judgment of the earth for their acts against his people, against Israel, and their rejection of God. So he is no longer patient because his patience has run out. So now they face the wrath of, the God, of God through Jesus Christ. So God spoke creation into existence from the beginning. He didn't just create it with his hand. He spoke it into, into, into being. So the word of God has power. This is power. That sword of truth, that it cuts both ways because it's a two-edged sword, truth cuts both ways. Okay? So he is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So here, in Revelation 21, we start to see about the, the new uh, Jerusalem. And what specific features about the new heaven and the new earth will bring you the greatest joy? The list can be long indeed. For example, eternal life, new bodies, no death, no hunger, no thirst, no disease, eternal peace. That's, the list can be longer than that, believe me. And God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are with us. We are face to face. We are no longer separated. We are face to face with God. He will be our, we won't even need the Son, because He will be our life. So that is the greatest thing, is that we will be with him. So there will be a point where the New Jerusalem will come about after the world has been changed. A new heaven and a new earth. But first, the millennial reign of Christ right after Revelations. The, uh, the beast and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire. God's judgment comes upon the earth. And then in the end, he remakes the earth. He renews it. And there's a thousand years of peace with Jesus Christ. And then after that, the devil is released. They will bring, they'll, they'll try again to try to destroy God's people. But God says, not having anything of it, destroys them right there, sends them all into the lake of fire. And then the heavens and the earth are changed forever. And then there will be no more of this sin in the world or in us, because we'll be at peace with him forever and ever. Amen. So there's hope in the future. And Lord, we, we love what you have given to us up to now. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. But the blessings that you still have for us, Lord, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what you have restored for us, Lord. Thank you, Father, as this weekend, and it's the end of Thanksgiving here, that it's never the end of thanksgiving for us, Father, as we thank you every single day for all that you give to us and have given. And thank you for the things you don't give to us, the things that you keep from us, that you keep us growing in you. We want to bless your wonderful name and bless your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.